In Chapter 5, we're going to look at all types of consumer credit. This is probably one of the most important topics in this course. The use of credit is a major force in the U.S. economy. Misuse of credit causes a variety of problems, both personal and financial. Wise use of credit can make life easier. Unwise use is the road to disaster. These are the learning objectives for this chapter. As with previous chapters, we'll work our way through these one by one. First, we need to evaluate the pros and cons of using credit. What are the different types of credit available and where do they come from? If you're thinking about applying for credit or a loan, can you afford it? Learn to calculate the cost of credit. And if you're going to use credit, be prepared to protect your credit rating and manage debts. Before we look at the advantages or disadvantages, we need to be clear on definitions. Credit is an arrangement to receive cash, goods, or services now and pay for them later. Consumer credit refers to the use of credit by individuals, excluding home mortgages. And as mentioned, consumer credit is a major force in the U.S. economy. Before you plunge into using credit, consider, can you make the down payment? Are you going to have to use dollars from savings? Does the purchase fit in your budget? You do have a budget, right? Could credit be used in a better way? Do I need this now or could I postpone it? What are the trade-offs in now versus later? What will using credit cost in dollars psychologically? So what are the pros of using credit? Most obviously, you get whatever you're buying now. It allows you to make purchases when cash is low. Credit does provide a cushion for emergencies. That means do not max out your credit cards. Have that emergency cushion available. With store credit cards, you get advance notice of sales and coupons. It's far easier to return items bought on credit, and it's much easier to shop using credit. A big pro is that your monthly statement provides a clear record of your expenses. If you use one major card for virtually everything, you have one statement of everything and one monthly payment. It's far safer than carrying cash. Shopping online and hotel and car rentals require a credit card. You can take advantage of the float time. Many cards offer rebates, miles, points, or other rewards. Very importantly, wise use of credit indicates financial stability. Lots of advantages, but there's some downsides as well. It's easy to be tempted to overspend. After all, it's not real money. It's plastic. You are committing future income so it can slow progress towards your financial goals. If you don't make payment on time, merchandise can be repossessed. Credit costs money. You're using someone else's money and they charge for that. So the bottom line, is it worth it? There are two basic types of consumer credit. Closed-in credit is what you use at Best Buy to finance a TV. The credit is for the TV only and has a specific payoff schedule. Three types of closed-in credit. Installment sales, usually used for high ticket items. Installment cash, it's a direct loan. Single lump sum credit, it's short term, 30, 90 days. Opened end credit typically has a credit limit, but may be used for anything, either in a specific store or in any store accepting that credit card. A Macy's card is opened end credit. Visa is also opened end credit. This exhibit gives some examples of familiar sources of closed end credit, and opened-end credit. As this chart clearly shows, consumer credit has increased dramatically from $1,686 billion in 2000 to $4,176 billion in 2019. It truly is a major force in the U.S. economy. Opened-end credit generally refers to a store or a general-use credit card, though home equity loans are included in this group. These types of credit have a set credit limit based on the income and employment information you supply to the issuer. You can spend up to your credit limit. If you don't pay the bill in full by the due date, you'll be charged interest, and it can be significant. Paying the minimum payment is courting disaster. You should be working on Project A and seeing what happens when you only make the minimum payment each month. Revolving check credit is basically a bank line of credit that allows you to draw against it as needed by writing a specific type of check. Well, here's a subject most of us already know about, credit cards. According to the text, the average cardholder has nine credit cards. Credit card users fall into two categories. Convenience users pay off their balance every month. This is what you should aspire to be. You don't care about the interest rate. 
borrowers do not pay off their balance each month. We pretty much all start out here and strive to be a convenience user. Most cards offer a grace period during which no finance charges are added to your account. After that, finance charges apply. Issuers frequently offer teaser rates to entice new users, then the rates rise after a few months. Many, if not all, cards offer some type of reward program, points, miles, cash, which can be enticing. Delta American Express offers Sky Miles. American Express Blue Cash offers cash. Discover offers cash. Amazon Visa offers points to use on Amazon. A kind of gray zone, credit like cards. Debit cards deduct money from your linked account immediately. Many banks offer their ATM cards as ATM, debit, and credit cards if you choose to use them in all three ways. Stored value cards are gift cards or prepaid phone cards. Smart cards with an embedded chip are the new norm in credit cards in the U.S., though they've been in the use outside the U.S. for some time. Touted as safer than swiping, inserting a smart card provides more security at checkout. So-called T&E cards, like American Express, are an example of convenience cards. The full balance is due each month. Amex also offers other card options that act as standard credit cards, like Blue Cash. The latest innovation in credit is paying via your smartphone. Using Apple Wallet, Samsung Pay, Android Pay, you can simply hold your phone near a terminal and have it beam the needed data. With the Apple Watch linked to Apple Pay on your iPhone, you can do the same with the watch. This chart, the first part of Exhibit 5.3, in your text, recaps the various sources of consumer credit, the types of credit, and the policies of each. Commercial banks lead the way with the most options in terms of loans. Consumer finance companies will often lend to those without established credit histories. Credit unions are excellent sources of credit as you're a member and share in the profits. Life insurance companies offer a limited source of credit. And finally, federal SNLs offer primarily loans requiring collateral. Depending on which type of credit you're seeking, this should give you an idea of the sources. Loans are basically just borrowing money with an agreement to repay it at a certain time. The most inexpensive loans are from parents or family members. Medium cost loans come from banks, SNLs, and credit unions. Expensive loans are available from finance and check cashing firms. Depending on current promotions, retailers may be expensive or running a deal, zero interest for 72 months or on a new car, or zero percent on a TV for two years. Bank credit cards and cash advances tend to be very expensive. If you need to borrow money, work your way from least to most expensive. Home equity loans are quite commonly used for home improvements, but the money can actually be used for anything. The main point is your home is pledged as collateral against the loan. Keep that in mind. These should only be used for major purchases, if not actually for home improvements. Current tax law, however, allows you to deduct the interest on a home equity loan, just as you do the interest on your mortgage. Home equity lenders usually allow 75 to 85 percent of a home's value minus any outstanding mortgage. An example on the following slide walks through an example. Here's a simple home equity loan example. Your home is worth $200,000. You owe $100,000 on the mortgage. If a home equity lender will allow up to 75% loan to value, how much can you borrow? $200,000 times 75% is $150,000 minus your mortgage $100,000 so you can borrow $50,000. So, can you afford a loan? Basic considerations. Can you meet all of your essential expenses and make the loan payments? What are you planning to give up to make the payments? Two general rules of credit capacity. Your debt payments to income ratio should not exceed 20% of your net income. 15% is better. 20% is the max. This refers to consumer credit payments and does not include a mortgage payment. The second rule of credit capacity. Your debt to equity ratio should be less than one. You should have more net worth than liabilities. Debt to equity is total liabilities divided by net worth. Your mortgage is excluded from the numerator and the value of your home is excluded from the denominator. When you're ready to apply for a loan or credit, these are the criteria a lender or card issuer will be looking at to determine if you're credit worthy. Call the five C's of credit. Character. Will you repay the loan? Have you shown yourself to be a responsible user of debt? Repaying loans in the past. 
How long have you lived at your current address? Been at your current employer? Capacity. Can you repay the loan? How much do you make? What other liabilities do you have? Capital. What are your assets and net worth? If you're applying for a mortgage, the issuer will want a net worth statement clearly detailing your assets and liabilities. Collateral. What if you don't repay the loan? Are you offering any assets as collateral against the loan? Conditions. Is your job secure? The bottom line of all this is a credit rating. Your credit report is a complete history of your use of credit. There are three major credit bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. Credit bureaus receive data from banks and businesses on how well you meet your debt obligations. Credit files contain a vast amount of information. The basics, name, address, social security number, date of birth, your employer, position, income, length of employment, homeowner or renter, and all credit-related events. The Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1971 requires that out-of-date information be deleted from your file. It gives consumers, you, access to your file and the ability to correct erroneous information. The law also places limits on who can obtain your credit report. So who can? Only authorized persons for approved legitimate business purposes. It can also be supplied in response to a court order, and you can request a copy yourself. Unfavorable information can only be reported for seven years, but bankruptcy can remain on your credit report for 10 years. These time limits can be waived if you're applying for credit greater than $75,000 or life insurance in excess of $150,000. So what do you do if you suspect incorrect information is in your credit report? If you're denied credit, you can request a free copy of your credit report within 60 days of the denial. We're all allowed one free copy each year. If data in your credit report is incorrect, you can sue the credit bureau or the creditor who caused the harm. The standard credit score is called your FICO score. FICO comes from Fair Isaac Corporation. FICO scores range from 350 to 850. The higher the score, the less risk. They can be a obtained from several sources for a fee, for free from some, and they're printed on your Discover bill. The Vantage score is a new credit score developed by the three bureaus together, and those scores range from 501 to 990. The model is supposed to be more predictive and better for those with limited credit histories. For those with very limited credit history, the PRBC, Payment Reporting Bills Credit System, offers an alternative way to demonstrate credit worthiness. The PRBC system records timely payment of rent, phone, and utility bills, for example. This chart in your text shows what forms the basis for your credit score. 10% new credit, 10% types of credit used, 15% length of your credit history, 30% amounts owed, 35% payment history. As you can see, a great deal depends on how much you owe and your payment history. You may be asked for your age on a credit application, but if you're old enough to sign a legal document in your state, then a creditor may not turn you down or decrease your credit because of your age. Public assistance. You may not be denied credit because you receive Social Security or public assistance, but this source of income can be considered in determining your credit worthiness. Housing loans. The ECOA bans discrimination based on race or nationality regarding mortgages or home improvement loans. It's called redlining. Risk-based pricing. A lender using risk-based pricing to charge higher rates to less creditworthy borrowers must disclose this and explain why you're not getting the best rate. The ECOA requires that if you are denied credit, you must be told the reason. Remember, if the denial is based on your credit report, you have the right to be told your credit score and to receive a free report within 60 days. This diagram in your text provides a clear path as to what to do if you're denied credit. The left-hand leg covers what to do if the reason for the denial is valid. Ask about alternatives, apply to another lender who may have different criteria, improve your score. The center leg, if you're not sure, ask. The right-hand leg, if you believe the reasons for your denial are invalid or discriminatory, file suit. If your credit score is not where you need or want it to be, how do you improve it? Well, the first step is to get copies of all three credit reports and verify all the information. Religiously pay your bills on time. Understand what goes into your score and what you can do to affect it. If legal steps are required, learn what they are and proceed. And beware of credit repair scams.
Using other people's money is not free. If you borrow money, which is, in effect, what you're doing, whether you receive cash or a product or a service, there are finance charges. How large these are is critical to your decision whether or not to use credit. Technically, a finance charge is the dollar amount you pay above the cash purchase price to use credit. It includes the interest, fees such as service charges, credit-related insurance, and appraisal fees if it's a home loan. Remember, finance rates must be quoted as APRs. An APR is the periodic rate times the number of periods per year. Shop around. Credit can vary widely. The formula on the slide approximates the annual percentage rate. Note the variables required. Lowercase n is the number of payment periods in a year. If it's monthly, it's 12. I is the total dollar cost of credit. P is the principal, the amount of a loan. Capital N is the total number of payments scheduled to pay off the loan. We'll look at an example on the next slide. This example compares two payoff patterns. The loan is $100 for one year at 10%. It is either paid off in one lump sum or as 12 monthly payments. This slide finds the approximate APR for the lump sum payment. Lowercase n, one payment per year. The cost of credit, 10% times $100, $10. P, the amount borrowed, $100. N, there's one total payment. Filling in the formula, 10%. This continues the example with the 12-month payoff. N is 12 payments per year. It's a monthly. I is the cost of credit again, still $10. The amount borrowed is still $100. In this case, capital N is 12. They're 12 total payments. The APR for this, $18.46 versus 10% for the lump sum payoff. When considering a loan or financing, there are trade-offs. Features you'd like versus the rate you'll have to pay. A shorter term loan is less risky for the lender, so you'll get a lower rate, but your payments will be higher. You might like a low payment loan with a large balloon payment at the end, but this is risky for the lender, higher rate. Basically, the riskier a loan is for the lender, the higher the rate he'll demand. So what can you do? Accept a variable interest rate, provide collateral, make a bigger down payment, take a shorter term loan. This slide defines three ways that the cost of credit can be calculated. Simple interest. It's just that simple. Rate times the amount borrowed. Remember Chapter 1 Appendix on Time Value of Money? Simple interest on the declining balance. Interest is only charged on the remaining amount outstanding on the loan. Add-on interest. Interest is calculated on the original total and added to the balance before the periodic payment is calculated. In this example, a relative is loaning you $1,000 to buy a laptop. You'll be charged 5% interest and you'll pay it year-end. Using the simple interest formula, total interest paid is $50. Using the APR formula, your rate is 5%. A bit more about the cost of credit. Remember, lenders are required by law to quote you the rate as an APR. Lenders will incorporate expected inflation into the rate they quote. Avoid the minimum monthly payment trap. Credit card statements now must show you how long it will take you to pay off your balance if you pay the minimum payment. Project A should help you see this clearly. Once you have credit and a decent credit rating, you need to protect it. Your credit rating can not only affect your ability to buy a car or home, prospective employers may check your credit rating. A strong rating indicates a responsible adult. Car insurance rates can also be affected by your credit rating. Same reason. So let's look at the laws, and there's a lot of them, that help you protect your credit. The Fair Credit Billing Act of 1975 has the following provisions. You are required to notify a creditor in writing within 60 days of an error. You must pay the part of the bill not in dispute. The creditor has 30 days to respond. They're given 90 days to either correct your account or explain why. Further, a creditor cannot threaten your credit rating while you're negotiating disputed charges. An action must wait until the dispute is settled. If you receive defective goods or services and have made a sincere effort to resolve the issue with the company to no avail, you can ask your credit card company to stop the payment. Identity theft has become a huge issue. Here's what to do if you believe your identity has been stolen. Contact all three credit bureaus immediately to institute a fraud alert. Check for any accounts not opened by you and cancel them. File a police report. This is critical going forward to demonstrate the validity of your claim and establish the date of the event. 
to protect yourself on an ongoing basis. Shred any documents with personal information that could be used to steal your identity or, or fraudulently use your credit. Shredders are cheap. Check credit card machines for skimmers, especially ATMs and gas stations. If you suspect a problem, contact the creditor and close the account. Make sure to get your credit card back after a transaction. I actually know people who never let their credit card out of their sight. If they're going out to dinner, they take enough cash. Keep a record of your credit card numbers and the 800 numbers to call in an emergency. Taking a picture of the front and back of each card with your phone is not a bad idea. This should go without saying. Contact your credit card company immediately. Truthfully, the major credit card companies are watching your transaction history and they may well be the one to call you if they see something that doesn't look right. I've had Visa call me to ask if I was making a purchase at a Toys R Us in Dallas since that didn't fit with recent transactions. Wasn't me. They denied it, issued me a new card. We all shop online, and many of us bank online. Online security is critical. The major browsers are relatively secure, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Of course, keep records of what you do online and review your statements to make sure they match what you did. I truly believe no one actually reads the privacy and security policy of a website. You just click agree and move on. But you really should read them. Do we have to say it? Keep your personal information private and don't share your passwords. And do not download strange files or click on links. Phishing is so prevalent. I get about three phishing alerts a week from Ole Miss. Just because it looks like it came from your bank doesn't mean it did. You can hover over the link and see where it really goes. Links can be faked. A special caveat on credit, co-signing a loan. Think long and hard before doing this. If a lender is requiring a co-signer, it means the borrower doesn't have good enough credit to get it on their own. If you co-sign and the borrower defaults, you're liable for the full amount plus any fees. If you're having a problem with consumer credit, your first step is to contact the creditor and try to resolve it. If that fails, file a formal complaint. This table and the continuation on the next slide details who to file a complaint with and the rest of the t places to file complaints. Here are eight major consumer credit protection laws currently on the books. Truth in Lending and Consumer Leasing Acts, Fair Credit and Charge Card Disclosure Act, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Fair Credit Billing Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Consumer Credit Reporting Reform Act, 1977, Electronic Funds Transfer Act, Credit Card Accountability, Responsibility, and Disclosure Act of 2009, known as the CARD Act. We are not going to go over each of these. The point is for you to realize the breadth of laws available to help you with a problem. Under all the consumer credit laws, you have the right to complain to the creditor, file a complaint with the government, and ultimately sue if all else fails. The relatively new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a government agency specifically created to make sure banks, lenders, and other financial companies treat you fairly. Okay, you've been using credit. Watch for these signs you may be in trouble. Paying only the minimum balance each month. A definite problem. Trouble even paying the minimum balance. This is really bad. Total balance increases every month. You're not making progress. Missing loan payments or paying late. This will affect your credit rating quickly. Using savings to pay for necessities. This is a sure sign you're overspending. Getting second or third payment notices. Borrowing money to pay old debts. Exceeding the credit limits on your credit cards. Denied credit due to a bad credit report. I don't think any of these need much explanation. If any of these begin to occur, it's time to take a serious look at your spending habits and use of credit before you're in too deep to get out. If you have a debt that goes to collections, there are laws that govern what actions debt collectors can take. For example, this usually prohibits calls before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m. or at times that are known to be inconvenient for the debtor. If you find yourself in trouble with debt, there are a variety of services available to provide education, develop a spending plan, and help you work out debt consolidation plans. Most of these services are low or no cost and well worth the effort to keep you out of bankruptcy. Counseling services are available at many venues, universities, family services, and many banks and credit unions offer counseling. What if you don't get your debts under control? Bankruptcy may be the only option, and it's a serious one. Remember, 
it stays on your credit report for 10 years. This could affect your ability to get credit again, buy a car or home, or even get a job. There are two chapters to the Personal Bankruptcy Act. Chapter 7 is Straight Bankruptcy. Chapter 13 is called Wage Earner. Bankruptcies peaked in the United States in 2005, dropped dramatically, and then climbed again in 2010, but have been declining since. Unfortunately, the Memphis area has a very high percentage of personal bankruptcies. Chapter 7 is considered straight bankruptcy, and it's the most used one. This is basically a fresh start. Most debts are eliminated except child support and alimony, educational loans, taxes, and fines. The majority of assets are sold to pay creditors. Filers usually get to keep their home, auto, as well as appliances and tools required for work, among other items. This details more thoroughly what is and is not discharged under a Chapter 7 bankruptcy filing. You may no longer owe retail store charges, bank credit card charges, unsecured loans, unpaid hospital or physician's bills. You still may owe taxes and fines, child support and alimony, educational loans, debts from willful or malicious acts, crimes. The Bankruptcy Abuse Act of 2005, right after the height of the filings, was passed to make it more difficult to file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. It virtually forces a Chapter 13 wage earner filing. Debtors must wait eight years from a filing to file again. It requires consumer education on debt management, and it cracked down on bankruptcy mills, which I'm sorry to say we had a few in the area. Chapter 13 bankruptcy is a less drastic approach to debt resolution. Under a Chapter 13 filing, a debtor with regular income submits a plan to work off the debt over a period of up to five years. The debtor makes regular payments to a court-appointed trustee who oversees paying off the debts. If you file for bankruptcy, there will be lasting effects. Obtaining credit may be harder. Remember, on your credit report for 10 years. Chapter 13 filers will be viewed more positively than Chapter 7 filers. Bankruptcy should truly be a last resort. These final slides review the learning objectives for this chapter. Advantages and disadvantages of credit. Closed-end and opened-end credit and sources of credit. Ratios for measuring credit capacity, national credit bureaus, the five C's of credit worthiness. Calculating the cost of credit. What to do if you have problems with a credit purchase? Bankruptcy. This ends Chapter 5.